That, that's a very complicated question. Um, probably somewhat linked with augmented cognition. So I think the brain of the future is going to have some level of computer interface and machine learning algorithm helping it, and not really seeing it AI as a competition to the human brain, but more of a complement to it. So I think the brain of the future will have some level of AI extensions to it, probably to help with triage and other things. And probably is also going to be a brain, in addition to our normal regular senses, um, exposed and sort of adapted to all sort of augmented reality, being it in virtual reality environments and having social interactions that way, to all levels of extended like augmented reality and processing visually auditory, all this additional information. So I think it's going to be a connected brain um, in, in many ways to technology. is both difficult and, and challenging and exciting. Um, it's, it's a different pace, it's a different structure. Um, we're lucky enough to, to have um, investors and sponsors and advisory boards that is very much um, interested and looking forward to keep the scientific reliability in any kind of translational products that we're spinning. So I guess we have an easier situation in some other companies that have been really pressured to put some kind of product out in a year, that that would be dramatic probably. Uh, we are afford the luxury of, of this pipeline of time to really properly develop the product. But it, it's a different pace and you know sometimes you underestimate how much you, you have new findings scientifically speaking on academia, you have new even potentially IP intellectual property developed and you think it's going to be very easy to transform that into a product and then you realize that a whole layer of milestones and things that you need to have to move that scientific discovery into a viable usable product. Um, but it's, it's I've been really enjoying the journey. It's, it's exciting. It allows you to really see your intuitions and your scientific discoveries come to hopefully to fruition on, on something that can be actually translational, applicable and disruptive in society. So I think it gives you that gratification that sometimes you don't have when just doing pure research in academia, that you don't see the follow up and, and the follow through of a product. So you get that. But it's challenging. You need to adjust yourself to another pace and to another set of stakeholders um, in how we develop things. It's, it's um, well, that, that, that's a, a tricky question. I think, you know, there's different people pushing the envelope at different levels. Um, and, you know, when you have the healthcare situation, you have more entertainment or sports, um, you have mental fitness and training programs. So it's really going to depend on which field you're looking at. Um, NIH and academia and a lot of research translational institutes um, like the Allen Institute or the Salk Institute, they're still really pushing the envelope in many ways, even though I would say they're not really companies, they have the research institutes and related to academia. Um, and in terms of companies, it will really depend. Uh, and I think because it's such a new field, looking at brain interfaces, for instance, right, that you know, most of the companies are still like ours, they're still trying to figure out their space and, and what will be the, the best path forward. Um, while you see companies like you know, Apple or Google or Facebook being extremely interested in, in this brain space, in neuroscience space, but also trying to figure out how to get into it. Is it you know, via deliverable, like you know, virtual reality kind of thing? Is it via you know, some kind of medical application, translational application? So there's been you know, different companies sort of braving the way in different ways. Um, I think Achille Labs is a good example in terms of a company that, that started from the beginning building up a product that in this case is a game, um, but it's been now you know, through a long deep path of FDA um, approval, which they're still finishing getting. But you see you know, that as a leader, the pioneering a space for getting games as training games and behavioral therapies in a way that can become an actual prescribed medicine in a way. But most of them, it's still you know, almost too early to tell. I think people are trying different you know, avenues to get to things. So much, probably. Um, yeah, yeah, I think quite a great deal. Look, one of the things that I think for us and for other companies we've been trying to do is figuring out ways to bring sort of this research out of the lab. Um, and this is obviously important in terms of, of getting translational solutions that actually uh, can affect society in a positive manner. But the other part that is not least important is on scaling your understanding of the brain, right? Right now, we know a lot about the brain in confined environments uh, with small groups, like we compare, you know, 50 Alzheimer's patients with 50 controls and see how it changes. Um, but what we don't know enough for sure yet is one, how real life context will affect, you know, neural signatures, brain processing, associated with mental states, and also, you know, in a way how large scale templates 
uh, of a population of a certain brain marker will do. So I think that will be one of, of the critical things is we'll, we'll learn much more about how the brain reacts and behaves on the neural oscillators correlated to states at large on, on daily life tasks, but also we're gonna start having large scale templates that will allow you to then tune down and, and figure out neurofeedback techniques, understanding the brain better, develop drug therapies and, and all that.